Greetings, philosophy students. Today we're going to talk about Sextus Empiricus. Sextus lived somewhere around ancient Greece. He lived some four or five hundred years after Plato and Aristotle, but the movement of skepticism, which he discusses, goes all the way back to uh, ancient Greece. So Plato and Aristotle would have uh, been aware of arguments similar to the ones that um, Sextus discusses. And Plato and Aristotle were both very against uh, the idea of skepticism for reasons that we will see pretty soon here. You also notice that I have the text from your textbook over here on the right. Uh, the writing of Sextus is so clear. This is a great time for you to start digging into the textbook, thinking about how to analyze the text itself and how this can help you to understand the ideas of um, the philosophers that we're reading. So I'm going to make up my way through this lecture by actually looking back to the writings of Sextus. And this will also be a model to show you the process that I hope you're going through as you read very carefully through these readings and you think very carefully through the lectures. I definitely want to make sure that with the lectures you're not just watching them as if they're a movie and then hoping that the ideas kind of get internalized and processed or with the reading I'm hoping you're not just reading it like a story and then hoping that that's enough to get the ideas so that you can really work with them. To get that far you have to analyze these things carefully. You really should be taking notes either on old-fashioned pen and paper or um, on your computer so that those notes they're not just something to refer back to but they're a way to organize your ideas and the things that you're thinking and understanding. So I'm also going to try to model that as we make our way through the discussion here today. So the writings from Sextus here start out with these claims. He's asking, what is skepticism? In the first excerpt from your reading. And so I'll read it out loud. Skepticism is an ability or mental attitude which opposes appearances to judgments in any way whatsoever, with the result that owing to the equipollence of the objects and reasons thus opposed, we are brought firstly to a state of mental suspense and next to a state of unperturbedness or quietude. So looking closely at the text here, we see that he's defining skepticism as an ability or mental attitude which opposes appearances to judgments in any way whatsoever. So we know that two key things are being put in opposition by Sextus here, and those two things are appearances and judgments. And that for Sextus, somehow these are opposed uh, in such a way that something emerges from this. What that something is, he refers to as equipollence. Now, why is Sextus going to do this? Well, he tells us that here as well, with the result that, owing to the equipollence of the objects and reasons, we are brought firstly to a state of mental suspense and next to a state of unperturbedness. But let's start with this idea of equipollence. Um, and so let's look in here to see what these things mean. He starts out like he ought to, by defining these words. So, by appearances, we mean the objects of sense perception. Okay, so he's defining these for us, which is helpful. Appearances are um, how things seem especially as seen through the senses. 
And then he tells us we contrast that with objects of thought or judgments. So judgments is just sort of how we think about things or how we judge the world to be. Um, so appearances are how things seem. Judgments are um, how we decide the world really is. So things appear some way, and then we want to make a judgment, at least we do make judgments, about how things actually are. Now he goes on to say that when he wants to contrast appearances and judgments, he's not just um, saying it has to be a judgment with an appearance or an appearance with a judgment. He says we do this in any way whatsoever. So maybe we contrast judgments with judgments. Uh, so, for example, if two people are saying, here's how the world really is, and they contrast with each other, that's a contrast or an opposition of judgments. An opposition of appearances would be something like, well, the world looks a certain way to me when I look at it this way, and it looks a certain way to me when I look at it that way. And as we've seen, this is supposed to lead for us to a state of equipollence. And here he goes on to say what equipollence is. Equipollence we use of equality in respect of probability and improbability to indicate that no one of the conflicting judgments takes precedence over the other as being probable. Okay, so now we know what he's up to with equipollence. And what is he going to try to be doing with the equipollence? So in terms of probability then, using sort of a, a random scale, let's say that the world appears to us to be a certain way, and we give that 100 units of believability. Uh, but when we think about it and try to understand how it really is, it seems a different way, and we give it 100 units of probability. Ultimately, when we contrast how the world seems with how we think the world is, the appearances are just as believable as is our judgment, and so ultimately we just say, well, I have just as much reason to believe one as to believe the other. Now, back to this question then of why. Why are we doing this in the first place? We saw in the very first section here that Sextus wants to get us to um, first to a state of mental suspense, and then to a state of unperturbedness or quietude. Okay, mental suspense, and then unperturbedness or quietude. So, at least two things are supposed to happen here, then, according to Sextus. One is I have mental suspense. And that's supposed to be something that we want to achieve out of this equipollence and contrasting of appearances to judgment. And the next is quietude. And this, again, is going to be something that I'm supposed to want to have. Okay, well, what do these mean? In the end of the section, he defines them. So suspense is a state of mental rest owing to which we neither deny nor affirm anything. And quietude is an untroubled or tranquil condition of the soul. And how quietude enters the soul along with suspension of judgment, well, he's going to cover that later. Okay, so what's the goal then for Sextus? He wants us to be contrasting and comparing appearances with judgments, certain judgments with other judgments, we end up with a state of equipollence, and then in the end, this leads us to mental suspense, which basically just means we don't make any more judgments.
Now, why would we be doing that? Why would that be a good thing for us to get to the point where we can't say for sure what anything is like? Well, Sextus is going to claim that this creates, this creates a sense of quietude, which as he describes it is just a state of mental rest, which is what we might call peace. So this is the basic uh, approach of the skeptic, at least as Sextus sees it. Sextus goes through this process of doubting everything by giving us opposing beliefs, opposing appearances, none of which convince us. Eventually we just say, well, I don't know. Could be one way, could be the other way. I have no way to tell. I'm not going to try to judge it anymore. Why is that supposed to be a good thing? It's supposed to give me a sense of quietude and make me be at peace. Uh, imagine some of these big questions that Plato and Aristotle, for example, were dealing with. Um, what happens when we die? Is anything eternal? What's true justice? Um, can peace or virtue be found on earth? Do, what do we really know and how do we get to know it? Any of these could be along with an investigative pursuit that for Plato and Aristotle was rewarding, could also be seen as a difficult thing to deal with or something that would cause a stress or discontent. In this way, the philosophy of someone like Sextus is actually meant to be almost like a psychotherapeutic function. It's meant to make you find peace by saying something like, well, no one really knows anyway. And so I guess I can just be at peace with myself. Now in the next section of our reading, still in... Um, on that same page for Sextus, there's another quote that qualifies what we talked about in an important way. So here Sextus asks, well, are we saying then that for the skeptic, appearances are abolished? We can't even say how things seem to us? And here Sextus starts to answer that question. He says, those who say that skeptics abolish appearances or phenomena just how things seem to us, seem to me to be unacquainted with the statements of our school. For we have said above, we do not overthrow the effect of sense impressions, which include our assent involuntarily. In other words, we have no choice but to see the world the way we see it. Um, the sky looks blue, and that's just a fact. It looks blue to us. And these impressions are the appearances. And when we question whether the underlying object is such as it appears, we grant the fact that it appears, and our doubt does not concern the appearance itself, but the account given of that appearance. And that is a different thing from questioning the appearance. Okay, so going back to this, we would be asking ourselves, okay, sexist, are you saying that by the time we get to this state of quietude, we just have no idea what we think or what we should do. Won't we just be paralyzed? And Sextus wants to say, well, no, because one of these elements is still left intact for us. We don't deny appearances. We don't deny that the sky seems blue to us. We don't even deny that certain things seem better than other things or that from our point of view, it appears that uh, when an apple falls from the tree, it always falls down. What he is denying is that we can make, or should make, or would want to make judgments to say, and because it appears that way to me, this is how it absolutely is. So he doesn't see it the way many um, opponents of skepticism would to say, well, if you doubt everything, you just can't do anything at all. And Sextus wants to say, no, we have our appearances, and we go with that. But if someone comes back and says, oh, but I know absolutely the way Plato would say, here's what's good in all circumstances for everyone. Here's the objective truth about the world or Aristotle's sense of certainty with um, certain observations about the physical world, or at least its ability to give us knowledge. Sextus would say, 
Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. I don't know for sure. You don't know for sure. I can give you a hundred reasons to think that's right and a hundred reasons to think it's not right. And so I end up in equipollence where I just um, don't have to know ultimately what's true and what's not true. So spend a little bit of time thinking about what you, what you think of the approach of Sextus here. Um, would you agree with Sextus that by saying, well, nobody knows for sure, all I can say is how things seem to me and live my life by that, is a good therapeutic healthy way to live? Avoid some of the stress of everyday life and everyone trying to make, uh, tell you that they know the truth and worrying for yourself if you know the truth? Or would you agree more with someone like Plato who would say, you have to find that absolute truth that's beyond all appearances? Or maybe more with someone like Aristotle who's going to say, there's a process of looking at the world, observing the world, to find the principles, what we would call the laws, behind um, the observations that we see, and to get at the truth in that way. Which of these appeals to you the most? Uh, we will be discussing that as we move on and talk a bit more about sextus.